Please take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 20, and I continue the reading of earlier with verse 19. So, when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here your finger and see my hands, and reach here your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said, to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, because you have seen, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. We have been making our way through the Gospels, and we come essentially to a concluding point today. Many of you have been following along in your daily Bible reading from Robert Murray McShane's schedule of Bible readings, and these Sunday sermons have been tracking along with one of those columns. And so we've come through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and now John. John begins with a prologue. At the outset of his gospel, he takes a few verses to introduce Jesus, and so there is a prologue and then at the conclusion of John, there is an epilogue. There is a foreword and an afterword. You might say a preface and an end note. John, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, is struggling to tell a story which is truly, in this world, beyond belief. How do you even begin? Where do you end? What do you include and what is to be left out? John begins by saying, in the beginning. He begins in the beginning. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was divine. He was in the beginning with God. John chapter 21 is what we regard as the epilogue. It is not to be derided or scorned or maligned in any way. It's just that John has built to such a pinnacle point at the conclusion of chapter 20 with Jesus having been raised from the dead and having appeared to his disciples and John here he specifically, in two verses, tells 
why in the world have I bothered to write this account? And he says that belief might arise, that it might so vividly, brilliantly, beautifully come to your heart and that it might live there. John chapter 21, the epilogue, it most certainly has purpose and value and it is a treasure as Jesus meets with his disciples by the Sea of Galilee and speaks specifically to Peter who had failed his Lord and how we cherish every word that is written there. But I would want you to hear most specifically what took place right at the point of the resurrection and the few days that go thereafter. And John, as he says, this is the reason why I've written this to you, that faith might be beautiful and that it might be living, residing, tabernacling in your heart. Merrill Tenney passed away some years ago now, but his commentary on John builds most especially on these two verses at the end of chapter 20, and he calls that book, John, the Gospel of Belief. The Gospel of Belief. If you're looking for an excellent read, dig up that book. But here Jesus as he has been making his way along, and as John is telling the story, he brings us to this point, and he continues to drive us and move us forward that we might understand exactly who Jesus is. Now, John has taken a little bit of a different approach than the other gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John has written for us seven sign miracles. He plainly declares these aren't all of them, but he picks out and records for us seven, which in their own sphere record for us the vast power of Jesus over every aspect of life, and most especially over death itself. John has also given to us the seven I am's, which focus pointedly upon Jesus. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is all of these and so much more. John has also recorded for us that whereas we have repeatedly seen Jesus in front of dozens, hundreds, and even thousands of people preaching the gospel and ministering to people, and how those people were, were riveted to his words and what jealousy there sparked in the lives of the Pharisees and the Sadducees who only could dream of having crowds like that, we not only see Jesus before those vast crowds, but John takes us to several intimate, private engagements, conversations. We think in John chapter 3 how that late one night Nicodemus, a Pharisee, comes to Jesus with some questions. And Jesus talks to him, and Nicodemus, his head is just about to explode. He says, how can these things be? I don't understand. And Jesus responds to him, really? You're a teacher in Israel, and you don't even understand these basic principles that you must be born again. You think that you have been alive, but you have never yet known life if you haven't been born again. You are under a false delusion if you think that you have entered into life, if you're simply breathing. You haven't entered into anything at all. You need to be born again, Nicodemus. At John chapter 4, we have Jesus then. In the middle of the day, 
There wasn't anything sordid about it. In the middle of the day, alone with a woman of Samaria, talking with her, speaking to her words of life, words that made her heart jump. Jesus spoke to her about living water. And she said, oh, give, of, give to me that water. That sounds so good. Jesus, as we considered on Good Friday, would also speak to Pilate. He would speak to him about all those who hear the truth, come to me. And Pilate, he had asked Jesus, are you a king? And Jesus said, yep, that's right. That's right, I am. For this reason I came into the world. And Pilate, when he heard Jesus speak of truth, Pilate having been overwhelmed undoubtedly from countless court cases, from slippery lawyers and shifty witnesses and all kinds of playing and manipulation and movements, he said, what is truth? And he turns away. You could say that Pilate repented. That is what repentance is. It is to turn, but Pilate repented the wrong way. He turned away from Jesus rather than turning to him full face. He turned away from him who is life itself and light and truth. Well, Jesus was laid in that tomb, having been so viciously treated upon the cross and scorned, I'm sure that the Jewish religious leaders, they were elated. But let me share something with you. Sin and its promised joys slip away all so quickly. I'm sure that the religious leaders at first had a surge of joy in their heart that this enemy of theirs, that they had triumphed over him, that they had carried the day, but almost instantly there is that thought, you know what, this could all go wrong. His disciples could steal away his body and then we would have an even bigger mess upon our hands. What a picture that is of Satan's promised joys being so like water that slips through our hands and it is gone. They thought they had Jesus, but there was no peace in their hearts that it was truly done. So they set the seal upon the stone, but Jesus didn't matter if there was a thousand stones laid over that grave. It didn't matter if there was a thousand seals from all of the empires and all of the kingdoms that this world had ever known or would know. Jesus bested death and he was alive. Alas, it was a woman or rather women who came, first of all, to the tomb. And they come and they report to the disciples what they had seen. Peter and John, they are the first ones to beat it back to the tomb. John makes it there ahead of Peter. Maybe Peter wasn't in as good a shape as he used to be, or maybe his legs were just a little on the shorter side. But John makes it there first, doesn't go straight in, stoops down, looks in. Peter comes up and barrels right in, and they see, and they understand, and they believe. But they go their way. Mary, she stands outside the tomb, and she imagines that it's the gardener that's speaking to her. 
But all of a sudden, she realizes that it is her Lord, and she grabs him. And Jesus says, stop clinging to me. Go and tell my brethren these things. And, they, and she comes and says, I've seen the Lord that day, that day. Doors closed, still fearful for what the Jews might do to them. Jesus comes and he stands in their midst and he says these words, peace be with you. Shalom, shalom. You remember that Jesus, as he was preparing his disciples for his departure, John chapter 14, he had said to them, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And he speaks to them about heaven. He speaks to them about that wonderful place that he was going to prepare for them. That they, where he was, they might be also. Thomas, he was the one who said, Lord, we're, we're more confused than we've ever been before. And we've sometimes been desperately confused. Lord, we don't know where you're going. We don't know the way. Please help us out here. And it was at that point that Jesus said, I, Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. All of your hopes, all of your aspirations, they are set upon me. And so Jesus now comes and he says, Right there in that particular meeting, he says, peace be with you. He would repeat those words eight days later when Thomas now joins the bunch. So three times in this brief portion of scripture, the word is said to them, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Shalom, peace be with you. And Jesus he breathes upon them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. But that first time, Thomas, he was missing. And oh, how he missed out. Now, I have a very charitable approach to Thomas. Thomas was a man of tremendous fiber. Before Christ's passion, we have it recorded that Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we might die with him. I didn't hear that from any of the others. But Jesus had spoken to his disciples about what was going ahead. And perhaps they sensed the growing tension of the religious leaders and the spies who were sort of circling around. Thomas had said, let us also go that we might die with him. But here Thomas, he was not there that first day. What a pitch this is for not missing out on church. Well, Thomas missed out on church that day and he missed out on a lot. The other disciples, they were saying, we have seen the Lord. Thomas essentially said to them, you're nuts. I don't know what's going on here, but there has been a collective delusion and you have wanted so badly to see what you wanted to see that you have collectively deluded yourself into believing something that is not so. Thomas says, I'm not going down that road. You guys can do whatever you like, but I'll tell you, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and actually not just see it, but unless I am able to put my finger into the place of the nails and furthermore, to put my whole hand into that side where we know the spear was stuck, I'm not going to believe. Well, eight days all the rest of the disciples are rejoicing that they had seen the Lord and that their beloved was alive. 
But Thomas was walking around with a face as long as a horse. And Thomas was still in mourning. Thomas was filled with grief. But Jesus, he wanted to catch Thomas up with all the rest of them. Eight days later, Thomas was with them this time, and Jesus came, and the doors again shut and closed. And Jesus, he's standing right there in the midst of them, and he says those words once again, the words that he speaks with such authority. I find that in the midst of our world, there are a lot of people who are troubled. And the question that is unspoken is, has God lost his grip on the steering wheel of this world? Has God lost his grip on the steering wheel of this world and so that we are careening out of control? Eight days later, Jesus, he comes, stands in their midst, and he says with all authority, as he had said it before, he says, this is what I want you to have in your hearts. I want to plant it there, and I want it to sprout and bloom and grow and become stable and to hold you steady. Peace be with you. And he addresses especially Thomas Thomas, come on. I know what you said. Bring your finger over here. The Greek actually says, carry your finger here, as though it was something that was detached. He said, carry your finger over here, and look at these hands. See these hands, and carry your hand over here, and put it into my side, uh, Thomas, I don't want you to be unbelieving. I want you to be believing. Once again, John, as he is writing here, he is driving us that he is not simply giving us historical information. He is is, is drawing us and, and propelling us to a point that we might believe. Thomas, he sees this unfolding all before him, and he, his response is the right one. My Lord and my God. But John, he takes us out of that, and he says many other signs. You see, this is a selective gospel. There was so much else that could have been included The world and all of its books could not contain the things that Jesus did and said. John, he readily admits many, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples. This wasn't done in a cave far away just before one single person of privilege This was done in the presence of his disciples. So there were witnesses to what Jesus had done. It was a verifiable gospel. It was a verifiable account that John is telling us. John says, these, out of all that I could have chosen from, these I have specifically brought to you that you might, and this leads us, from the signs to the belief to life. The signs, the accounts have been given to us in order that, as Paul in Romans speaks, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. These things have been written. These are pointing you to Jesus Christ, the one who is the Son of God, that that might grip you, that you might understand He was not just a man. He was not just one misunderstood, maligned, martyred, and dead. But that he was utterly unique. He was the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the unique one, the very Son of God. The Apostle Paul, after his conversion on the Damascus Road, 
we know that for about three years, he went away into Arabia in order for the truths, the, the radical change that it might so permeate him in every way. I'm sure that for many people who heard that Jesus was the Son of God, they needed time to let that really grip a hold of them because they had previously been so counter. Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, but not simply that it might be a belief in a vacuum, but that there might be further that through believing on the name of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, that these people might have life, life abundant and everlasting. We come once again to Resurrection Day. Every Sunday is the celebration of the resurrection. On Faith to Live By, repeatedly I get the question, why in the world do some people worship on Saturday and some people worship on Sunday? It's that we celebrate the resurrection. The seventh day is celebrating the work of God as he completed the work of creation. Sunday, it's celebrating that greater work of God's redemption of his fallen creation. And so we worship on Sunday, though truly every day of the week should be a day of worshiping our Lord. But here we come, and John is saying to us, I have laid it out as plainly as I can, the Holy Spirit so working through me and this is what I desire of you, not that you just take it as another ancient story, but that you might have something you never had before, that you might have faith, and that through that faith you might truly, truly, truly live as you have never done so before. Lord, I pray that there would be men and women here in whom your work would be so mighty this very day and that they would rejoice not simply with Easter lilies and chocolate eggs, but I pray that they would rejoice knowing that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has come into this world to die upon Calvary's cross but also to live in the power of the resurrection and that the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead, that same spirit dwells in each and every believer. Lord, I pray that there would be this conviction, this faith, this awareness, and this new birth today in hearts and lives. All, all for the glory of God and for your glory alone, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.